about to have the best tour of your lives, if you haven't noticed, is with the best looking beef eater in the Tower of London. Now do not take my word for it, when you see my colleagues, you'll see what exactly what I mean. Now before I start, are there any Americans, Canadians, Australians in the audience? Put your hands up now. Welcome home. <laughs> I'll show you where you're all staying later. Now I must warn you all, especially the children amongst you, my tour will contain murder, execution, and my favourite pastime, torture. So if it's not for your young, sensitive ears, feel free to leave my tour any time you like. Harry Potter world is that way. <laughs> Children happy to stay? We shall see. Now my name is Yeoman Warder Scott Kelly. I am one of 33 Yeoman Warders, nicknamed the Beef Eaters, that live in Her Majesty's Royal Palace and Fortress, the Tower of London, at all times at the quest of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Because we have been the King or Queen's ceremonial state bodyguard for over 500 years. In fact, we're the oldest born bodyguard in the world still in existence. But more about us handsome gentlemen later. Now our story begins way back in the year 1066, when William, Duke of Normandy, better known as William the Conqueror, defeated the Anglo-Saxon King Harold at the Battle of Hastings. Well done, ladies and gentlemen. There are times I want you to join in. <laughs> Failure not to join in resulted in some of you going to the Tower's torture exhibit. Some of you ladies might like it. <laughs> now, William was Crown King William I of England on Christmas Day that same year, but he had to continue to fight his newly conquered subjects. As they did not take kindly to Norman domination. Now William looked to locate a citadel so he could command and control the citizens of London. And he chose a site on the eastern edge of the city wall where once an old Roman fort had stood. It was here, ladies and gentlemen, in 1078 that he would authorize the building of his first royal palace and fortress here in England. Today, we refer to that building as the White Tower and it's situated behind these magnificent defensive walls. No point in looking, you cannot see it from here. It's gonna be a long afternoon, isn't it? Over the next 200 years, successive bonnets continued to add to the defense of the tower. The inner ballium or defensive wall consists of 13 smaller towers that were completed in 1220. The outer wall contains six further towers that are all situated on the southern edge to defend the tower from any attack that may come up the River Thames. To the north of the tower are two strong bastions, brass mount and legs mount that you can see in the far left hand corner. Inside and on top of would have been mounted cannons to defend the tower from any attack from that northerly direction. Currently behind you ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, is the third line of defence, the moat or ditch, and was once filled with water from the River Thames. Now twice a day, at high tide, the River Thames used to flow into and around the moat, keeping it fairly clean. Now this worked rather well at first, however, due to the amount of rubbish, dead bodies and excrement, that's poo children, directed into it from the tower and the local areas of Shoreditch and Houndsditch, the moat soon became known as the largest cesspit <coughs> in London. A source of pestilence to all those who lived nearby especially the 1,000 soldiers based in the tower garrison. Now this cesspit continued for over 500 years until in 1843, the then constable of the tower, the Duke of Wellington, asked permission from Queen Victoria to have the moat drained. Permission was granted and the Duke had it put in with sand and shingle, up to the height that you currently see it today. He then made good use of it as an excise area and parade ground for his soldiers of the tower garrison. Now, as I said earlier, this was his first royal palace and fortress. 
ever to be built in this country and has remained a royal residence up until 1603. The last monarch to reside in the White Tower was King James I. Now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, most of you haven't just come here for a short history lesson. Some of you want to know about murder, executions and torture. Am I right? Yes. We shall see. Now, when some of you arrived here today, you may have come by the subway, the tube station at the top of Tower Hill. Now, to the left, as I look, there's a large gathering of trees. Now, right in the centre of that is Trinity Square Gardens. That was the site of many executions. King Edward IV had a public scaffold erected up there in 1465, which caused much concern to the people of the city, having a public execution site on their south lawn. Over the years, no less than 75 men of noble birth were to lose their heads, up there by means of a solid block of oak and an axe. In fact, in total, over 1,500 people were executed outside on Tower Hill. Now imagine the scene on the day of execution. Thousands of men, women, even children would be gathered around the raised platform known as a scaffold to witness the proceedings. The prisoner, having said his final speech and prayers, would kneel down, placing his neck on a block of solid oak. He would then give a word or a signal to the executioner stood next to him. The executioner would bring the axe crashing down, hopefully beheading his victim with one stroke, which let me tell you, boys and girls, rarely happened. The executioner would then pick up the seven still bleeding head and raise it aloft for all to see, as was the custom between the 14th and 18th century, to show that the head had been separated from the torso. Notice I picked this gentleman's head up by his hair. What would I have done if he was a bold man? He is no. No is far too cute. The preferred method? Inserted. Ah, oh. oh, you paid for this. <laughs> but my uh, favourite part to that is you can play at the eyes. Oh. <laughs> Fortunately, this young man's got a good head of hair. And as the executioner did back then, he would hold it aloft. He would then turn to the crowd and proclaim, Behold the head of a traitor! So die all traitors! God save the king! At this moment in time, all the crowd gathered around would go wild with excitement. Yay! Yay! Is that it? The Queen does not pay me enough for this. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was your moment to be part of history, to join in with the Tower of London. Some of you are either shy or not awake. So we're going to do that again, and I will be watching who doesn't join in. <laughs> the executioner would hold the head up high, turn to the crowd, wait for it, and proclaim, behold the head of a traitor, so dial traitors, God save the king! Hooray! God save the king! Hooray! Are you not entertaining children? <laughs> that head would then be impaled onto a soldier's pike and paraded through the streets of London towards London Bridge, which in those days was the only bridge across the River Thames. Everybody now point to where London Bridge is. Let's see you geographically challenged. Madam, I'm going to pick on you. You just, you just pointed to Tower Bridge. You are from the States, I assume. Well, you should know where London Bridge is. Because you brought the fake one. <laughs> Don't worry, my American brothers and sisters are going to rip into your lot today. That's only because I love you. Remember that, okay? Good. Now, that head would have been displayed above the entrance of London Bridge as a sign of the fate that awaited all would-be traitors. Meanwhile, the bloody headless corpse, still violently twitching, oozing copious amounts of blood. Children, you get the idea? would be taken off the scaffold, thrown into a small handcart, and brought back into the tower, where he'd be quickly buried in an unmarked grave beneath the floor of the Chapel Royal St. Peter Ad Vincula. Now the route that headless court would have taken is exactly the same we are all about to walk. But before we do, you're going to enter the Tower of London via the Byward Tower archway. Now as you walk under that archway, if you look up, 
you will see the spikes of a portcullis or Norman drop gate. One of two that remain here in the Tower of London. Both are in full working order. Now this one dates from 1326, weighs one and a half tons. The reason why I always walk through that archway very, very quickly is because the rope that is holding it up also dates from 1326. <laughs> one day it's going to break, hopefully on some students. <laughs> you will also notice three circular holes drilled into the stonework above your head. These are called murder holes and would be used by the defenders of the Bywood Tower to pour boiling oil or hot sand onto any would-be attackers trying to break in. Now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to lead a body of men, women and children at a rapid rate of knots into this fortress, as I am a Sergeant Major and more importantly, the Queen's ceremonial state bodyguard, I have my very own war cry. My war cry is, huzzah! After three, I want your best huzzah. If it's no good, you're going on your own tour. <laughs> One, two, three. Huzzah! One, two, three. Huzzah! Right, let's go. Move past stay low. Come on, children. Follow me, sir. Right, come on, you old lead. Keep up. gentlemen, you're now stood in the outer ward of the Tower of London, between the inner and outer defensive wall. The inner wall is 50 feet high. The outer wall behind you is 28 feet thick. The road to your left is called Mint Street, because until the year 1810, all the coins of the realm were designed and produced in buildings. The buildings that house the mint are known as the case made for houses. Now all of them, plus that chain going across the road, serve as accommodation for some of my fellow young water colleagues, their wives, their girlfriends, their unwanted children, and their dogs and their cats. <laughs> to your right is a tall, dark, now archway, known as the Byword Postman, the Sally Port, or the Royal Entrance, beyond which was a small drawbridge leading out to the Queen's Stairs and directly down to the River Thames. Now, rather than travel through the narrow back streets of London, royalty and nobility would travel down the River Thames in their luxurious barges, tie up by those stairs to enter the tower. Those gates are original, date back over 750 years old. In fact, it was exactly right beneath that archway that King Henry VIII got down on one knee and so lovingly greeted his second wife, Queen Anne Boleyn, mother of Queen Elizabeth I. Poor Anne was fated to return to the tower some three years later, for a very different reason and for a very different gate. Now in front of you to your right is the bell tower, so named because of the small white belfry at the top. It contains the oldest surviving curfew and alarm bell in the city of London. When it sounded an alarm, would signal for all the gates to be closed, the drop gates lowered, the drawbridges raised, and all the battlements manned in the fence. As you can see, an archer on top of the beach and tap. Don't worry, he's been there for 500 years and has not moved once. <laughs> Very well disciplined soldier, that boy. <laughs> now the bell tower is the strongest of the 13 towers within the inner wall. Stands on a solid masonry base, 30 feet deep, 20 feet below ground, and 10 feet above. It contains two circular prison chambers with walls 10 feet thick at the base, tapering to eight feet thick at the top. Now due to its form of construction, prisoners were held in both of these chambers. The man for all seasons, Sir Thomas More, one time Lord Chancellor of England, 
was held in the lower chamber by refusing to accept King Henry VIII as head of the Church of England. At the same time and for the same reason, John Fisher, the Bishop of Rochester, was held in the upper chamber, also known as the Strong Room. Now both men were to suffer terribly, but neither would be persuaded to abandon their beliefs. In 1535, both men were taken from the bell tower up to Tower Hill for public beheading. 400 years later, in 1935, both men were canonized as saints of the Roman Catholic faith. Now, another famous prisoner to be held in the strong room was a young, beautiful Princess Elizabeth Tudor. Her half sister, Queen Mary Tudor, had reason to believe Elizabeth was implicated in the Sir Thomas White Rebellion which was against the Queen's plans to marry King Philip II of Spain. Fortunately, she was proven innocent, although banished to Woodstock for a time. It would be four years until she'd returned to the Tower of London for her very own coronation. And the last time the Queen would visit the Tower in her long reign of nearly 45 years. Right, now for some blood and gore, are we ready? We shall see. Be brave, children. James Scott, the Duke of Monmouth, eldest of the 13 illegitimate children of King Charles II. He was a busy man, wasn't he? <laughs> he was also imprisoned in this tower. Now, after the death of his father in 1685, this extremely handsome, popular young man very much like myself, <laughs> was persuaded to stake his claim to the throne. To press home his claim, he landed in the West Country of England, marching inland, gaining popular Protestant support. It was to become known as the Monmouth Rebellion. Well, the revolt was crushed at the Battle of Sedgemoor on the 6th of July, 1685, but the Duke escaped the battlefield, evading capture for up to one week until he was found hiding, cowering in a ditch. Three days later, there was no need for a trial. He was taken from the bell tower up to Tower Hill for public execution. Ladies and gentlemen, this was to become known as the bloodiest execution in English history. Woo! Get excited. <laughs> the executioner went by the name of Jack Ketch. It is recorded Jack Ketch was approximately six foot eight tall, weighing well over 20 stone. He was a giant of a man, but he was a part time executioner. He was also a part time butcher. <laughs> but he was a full-time alcoholic. <laughs> Cheers. As most of them were back then, because they were hated in society. And on day of said execution, nothing could change. Because in a drunken stupor, it took Jack Ketch five strokes of the axe. The first stroke came down striking the Duke on the top of his left shoulder. The second stroke immediately followed, but unfortunately just skimmed the top of his head. As the Duke knelt there, squealing in agony, one of the clergy in the front row pointed to Jack Ketch and stated, Jack Ketch, if you do not complete this task, you, sir, will be next. Well, Jack Ketch started to sweat profusely. He continued with the execution. Three strokes later, he still hadn't severed the head from the body. Realizing right now his life was in imminent danger, he panicked and in a fit of rage, pulled out his butcher's carving knife, grabbed the Duke by the hair whilst he was still alive, pulled his head back 
at a 45 degree angle. Children, look away. <laughs> and started to cut away through the bone and sinew until the head was off. Everybody okay? <laughs> right. Little one, come here. Put both hands out. And the other one. Now normally, ladies and gentlemen, that head would have been displayed above London Bridge as a sign of the fate that awaited all would be traitors. But there's a massive twist to this story because they brought the Duke's head back into the tower of his body, which never, ever happened. And the reason why they did this is as Jack Ketch was cutting through the last bit of bone, remember that one, kids? <laughs> one of the clergy in the front row just remembered. We didn't have a portrait of the Duke. <laughs> so they brought his head and body back in, actually stitched it back on, <laughs> dressed him in all of his refinery, placed a Tudor ruff around his neck to cover the scarring. It makes for a beautiful watercolour, I see it. <laughs> but I've got to be honest, he does not look happy. <laughs> That's true, ladies and gentlemen, because when we exhumed his body in 1865, we indeed found that his head had been reattached to his torso. You can't make this up. It's our history. It's great. <laughs> right, as some of you are looking a bit squeamish and a bit green around the gills, I'm going to cheer you all up with my first joke. <laughs> now, I hope you enjoy it. I've been working on this one for a year and a half through this horrendous pandemic. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes! yes. Good enthusiasm, make it nice. Okay, here we go. Let's be heading off. <laughs> Huzzah! Hello. Come on, they get worse. Chop, chop this way. Princess Elizabeth Tudor, who I also mentioned earlier, 
but as you are now aware, left the tower unharmed. Now we're all happy. Everybody happy still. Good! Excellent. Good morning, Bachelor. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you another story. I'm not supposed to tell, but I get told off every time I do. But I'm going to. As I am the only male Scottish people to the Tower of London. I will tell you all of one William Wallace. Any English amongst you put your hands up now. Now bow your heads in shame. <laughs> now William was dragged up these stairs, but he spent a lot less time than all of you have in the Tower of London, because back then the English were snobs. They didn't recognise William's title, Lord Protector of Scotland. They classed William as a commoner. Commoners could be kept in the Tower of London, so he's taken directly down Water Lane to Smithfield Market, where he's hung, drawn, and watered. <laughs> I'm okay, I've got over it. <laughs> now I'll tell you, you should have been brought up these stairs instead. Mel Gibson! <laughs> he would have told you that an inch of his life! It's a totally inaccurate film braver. Mel Gibson would have you all believe when a man's lying on a cold slab of stone, being cut from nipple to navel, having his intestines ripped out, his heart plunged from his chest and placed on a hot griddle. Mel Gibson would have you all believe that a man can still summon up the words Freedom! He can! <laughs> Freedom! I think he had other things on his mind at the time, don't you? Might have been a bit of a distraction. <laughs> right, enough of that. Now behind you is the Wakefield Tower. Now that is infamous for two reasons, because in the lower part of the Wakefield, that's now the tower of torture exhibit. And when you go inside, entrances through the bloody tower arch, you turn immediately right. You will find some of the torture exhibits. However, during the War of the Roses after the Battle of Wakefield, 400 Yorkist prisoners were crammed into that lower dungeon, left there to rot. When you walk inside with about 30 people, it feels quite cramped. Imagine 400, no food, no water. It must have been horrendous. In the upper chamber, that's also infamous, because that's where the Lancastrian King Henry VI was murdered, stabbed in the back on the 21st of May, 1471. Now, immediately adjacent, though no longer connected, is the infamous Bloody Tower. Now, before I tell you anything about the Bloody Tower, I must ask the children present. Children, would you like to know about the Bloody Tower? Excellent, good, good, good. Originally, it was known as the Garden Tower. That sounds good. And the overlook allowed access to left hand in the garden. His name was changed to the Tower of Blood, or Bloody Tower, to commemorate the many tragedies that have happened in there. Surely the most tragic must be the alleged murder of the two boy princes. In 1483, the uncrowned King Edward V and his younger brother, Richard, Duke of York, aged 12 and 9. How old are you? Say. Say, <laughs> how old are you? Still, oh, we haven't got one. Right, oh, okay, no one fits the criteria. I'll find you. <laughs> Their little bodies were smothered to death in that upper chamber, whilst under protection of their uncle, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who then became King Richard III. Children of any of you got an uncle called Richard? <laughs> Don't trust him. <laughs> <laughs> Their little bodies were bundled down the stairs leading to the Wakefield Tower, quickly buried under a pile of stones. The following day, they were moved by an unknown priest to a secret plot under some stairs on the south side of the White Tower, where these bodies remained for 191 years, until during the reign of King Charles II in 1674, workmen discovered a hidden chest. They thought they were going to be rich on their wildest dreams, but when they opened his chest, what they actually found were the remains of two small skeletons. Experts of the day declare they're indeed the missing princes. So on the orders of the king, they were taken to Westminster Abbey and reinterred in Innocent's Corner, where they remain to this very day. Now children, don't worry. Your mums and dads will tell you that all happened a long time ago. It's exactly what I tell my two daughters. However, they will also tell you there are no more bad men out there. That's not completely true now, kids, is it? Because some of them 
might be hiding under your bed at night. <laughs> Sleep out, kids. <laughs> I really like children. <laughs> Okay, don't worry, they get it. I'm only joking. Or am I? Right! <laughs> part like the Red Sea, I'm having too much fun. I'm gonna lead you to the oldest part of the town, London, but I wanna feel my war cry. You know what it is, it's bizarre. One, two, three! Yeah. Right, let's go this way. <laughs> right, look up, see the second port colours. Weighs two and a half tons, it's over 750 years old. So I can leave it as such as the rubble. I'm only joking about under the bed, by the way. You can just put boxes under your bed. But as I told my daughters, it doesn't alleviate the problem because the bad people just move to the wardrobe. <laughs> right! Now all of you look behind you, and you'll see the Tower of London itself, more commonly referred to today as the White Tower. Now that is where all of our lines of kings and queens have lived for over 500 years. Make sure you go into that building. The entrance around the front on the south wall up the wooden stairs. That is the rear of the building and that's the way you'll come out. Right, so all the royal family lived in that building, folks, and we guarded them. That's where we got our nickname, the Beef Eaters, because we fed from their table. Whatever they were eating, our kings and queens, we ate venison, livestock, prime cuts of beef. All the peasants outside got very jealous of our position, nicknaming us the Beef Eaters. But children, I've got a little secret to tell you. We also eat our vegetables because it makes you big and strong. Just make sure you all do, and I'll be watching. Sounds a bit weird, I know. But anyway. <laughs> now, I have something else to tell you. In the lower part is the dungeon or torture chamber. Yes. It was a dark and evil smelling place, illuminated only by the torturous candle. No sounds of the cries of anguish would have been heard through those thick walls. Today, when you go down there and visit, and you will, you'll be astounded because it's disgusting, it's evil, it's satanic. It's now become the tower's kick shop. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the prices are murderous. <laughs> now our story here, ladies and gentlemen, would not be complete if I did not mention the tower ravens. These large black birds are a popular visitor attraction and are the largest members of the crow family. That's a pigeon. <laughs> oh, he is, he's hiding. Now, one of my colleagues looks after the ravens. He's known as the Raven Master. They get fed on two daily fresh rations of meat. Their treats include boiled eggs and biscuits soaked in children's blood. <laughs> oh, I'll get a happy meal out of you two, wouldn't I? <laughs> now the legend says, if the ravens ever leave the Tower of London, the White Tower would crumble to dust, the monarchy would cease to exist, and I would be about a job. <laughs> so to ensure none of those three things happen, we maintain an establishment of six ravens here at the Tower of London at all times. In fact, by Her Majesty's royal decree, the ravens are just as important as the crown jewels themselves, but not more important than the beef eaters that live. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, you're all currently standing on Tower Green, the village green of the Tower of London. But unlike most village greens, ours is unique. You may have a bowling lawn, a tennis court, even a cricket pavilion. We have our very own private execution site. Yes, sir, right what you're walking past. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> now that small glass pillow memorial should not be confused with the public scaffold on Tower Hill. This memorial remembers three queens of England, two lords, two ladies and three soldiers that were executed right there. Now before I tell you some of their stories, I'll tell you about some of the buildings that surround Tower Green. Immediately to your left down the cobble path is the entrance to the infamous bloody tower. Further to your right is a black and white Tudor building known as the Queen's House. It's called the Queen's House because guess why? Yes, it's still the Queen's House. It was built for Queen Anne Boleyn. But the resident queen doesn't want to live there. Probably because there's an execution site on the South Wall. <laughs> However, it is the only perfectly preserved Tudor residence in the whole of the city of London. Because it survived the Great Fire of London in 1666. Now the Queen's House has been the home to some important prisoners. Anybody here from Pennsylvania in the United States of America? Madam! Right at the back, let's pick on one of your treasonous ancestors. <laughs> William Penn was incarcerated in the Queen's House for his offensive writings. Even whilst he was imprisoned, he still managed to compile his controversial pamphlet, No Cross, No Crown. He was only released under the condition that he left England. So he sailed across the Atlantic and found his famous Quaker colony, Pennsylvania, in honour of his father. Did you know that, young lady? Every day's a school day, stay with me. <laughs> now the last state prisoner to be held in the Queen's House was Rudolf Hess, the deputy leader of Nazi Germany. Also, children, who else was kept in there, do you know? Why do we celebrate bonfire night? Guy Fawkes, well done, young man, yes. Guy Fawkes was held in there as he failed to block the House of Parliament in November 1605. He was taken to the White Tower, brutally racked to an inch of his life until he gave up the names of his fellow plotters. He was then taken to Westminster, where he was hung, drawn, and... Oh, my favourite bit. <laughs> Today, the Queen's House serves as the home to the constable of the Tower. He's a former general of the British Army, and he serves in the Tower of London as the Queen's official representative. Now, on either side, you'll see light-coloured blue and green doors. They date from slightly later periods and also serve as more accommodation for us Yeoman Warders to be people. So we live in the outer wall, and some of us live in these blue doors as well. Now, should any of us become poorly or very ill whilst we're here, we go to the blue door directly behind me, because that's the residence of my tower doctor. Now, if I get really poorly, I go to the blue door to his right, because that's the tower chaplain. <laughs> and he has the shortest commute of anybody in the city of London, because he works right next door in the beautiful Chapel Royal St. Peter Ad Vincula. One day a week, best job in the tower. <laughs> Further to your right, this grand building is the newest building within the complex. Erected in 1845, built to house a thousand soldiers of the tower garrison. It has now become the home to the crown jewels and royal regalia. This building is called the Waterloo Barracks, which commemorates our great victory over the French at the Battle of Waterloo. Huzzah! Huzzah! Any French amongst you? Put your hands up now. Any? None? If you're hiding, I'll find you. <laughs> <laughs> Bonjour, ça va bien? Go and visit your building. <laughs> now, ladies, when you go inside, you'll find the biggest diamond in the world. Cohen all won the start of Africa. Now when you see it, do not look at your husband or boyfriend with a tear in your eye. They could only afford what they could at the time, I'm sure. <laughs> now the far end of the square is the home of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, an old infantry regiment that was formed here in 1685. You can go and visit their museum on their ground floor. Now let's turn our attention back to the execution site behind me. Yes, madam, that mask will help you there. <laughs> now, what I'm about to tell you is quite harrowing to listen to, but it's part of our history. I'm sure you want to know it. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, we shall see. <laughs> Queen Anne Boleyn, second wife of King Henry VIII, was tried and found guilty on trumped up charges of high treason, incest, adultery, and witchcraft. 
She was executed right there on the 19th of May, 1536, but not with an axe. Anne feared the axe greatly. She begged, pleaded with King Henry VIII to be executed in the French manner with a two-handed, double-edged broadsword. Henry agreed to Anne's last wish, so he tasked a very skilled master French swordsman to travel over from Calais. Now, he was very sympathetic with Anne's plight, so much so, when he got on top of the wooden scaffold behind me, he hid the broadsword beneath some hay, as to cause Anne as least stress as was physically possible. When Anne walked on top of the wooden platform, she didn't see the broadsword. She was deep in thought and prayer. Her last words recorded in history are, Lord God, have pity on my miserable soul. Now, so professional and accurate was the French swordsman. Anne didn't hear or see the blade coming. With one stroke, he took her head clean off her shoulders. Now, it's recorded in history, as the executioner lifted up her head, as they did back then to all traitors, there was a gasp from the crowd. Because <laughs> it's recorded in history that her eyes were still moving around the crowd and her lips were still moving in prayer. Now, the only good part to this story is she would have been killed instantly. Anne knew under the axeman's blade she could have suffered terribly. Everybody okay? And it gets worse. <laughs> Five years later in 1541, it was the turn of Margaret Pole, the Countess of Salisbury. Now this dear lady had committed no crime, neither was she afforded the luxury of a trial. She was, however, the mother of Cardinal Reginald Pole. Now it's a cardinal that King Henry VIII would have dearly loved to get his hands on. But the cardinal was safe in Rome, preaching against Henry. Now as Henry couldn't get hold of the son, he decided to take his mother in his place. Now this brave, innocent, 70-year-old lady, who was last of the Plantagenet family, refused to place her neck on a block of solid oak behind me. In fact, she stood right there and stated proudly, it is for traitors, and I, sir, am not such. The executioner didn't know how to continue. He got down off the wooden platform, had a quick conversation with the clergy in the front row, regained his composure, stood back on the wooden platform, and then literally hacked her to pieces right where she stood. Oh, yes. <laughs> now, the following year in 1542, the axe unusually fell twice on the same day. This time the victims were Queen Catherine Howard, the fifth wife of King Henry VIII, and her lady-in-waiting, Jane Boleyn, the Vice Countess of Rochford. Now Catherine was executed for associations with other men, both during and before her marriage to King Henry VIII. But it was her affair with Thomas Culpepper, a gentleman at court in the White Tower, that was to be her undoing. Catherine's last words on the scaffold behind me. I die the Queen of England, but would so much rather die the wife of Thomas Culpepper. Was this an admission of love or guilt? We will never know. The trouble with this statement, <laughs> Thomas was stood in the crowd. His initial reaction, no, not me. <laughs> Too late, he was immediately dragged out of the crowd and executed right where he stood. <laughs> Love doesn't last, ladies. <laughs> now, I've told you all a little white lie, because Thomas was actually executed two months prior to Catherine's execution, but never let a good execution get away with a good story. <laughs> now, Jane Boleyn was executed immediately after Catherine because she knew of her mistress's affair, but had failed to inform the king. Back then, that was a crime punishable by death. Everybody's still okay. Unfortunately, ladies, we've got one more to execute. And the axe wouldn't fall again for another 12 years. And that would have been the tragic, innocent, 16-year-old Lady Jane Grey, the uncrowned queen of only nine days. Now, Lady Jane was a pawn in the struggle for power. After the death of her cousin, King Edward I, she was proclaimed queen, placed on the throne by her ambitious 
relatives. Jane Rawl from the White Tower only nine days until the rightful heir, Queen Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary, regain the throne by force of arms. Now Lady Jane and her young husband, the 19-year-old Lord Guildford Dudley, were dragged back in the tower under sentence of death. Lady Jane was imprisoned in the gentleman jailer's house number five, Tower Green, which is a blue door just behind that hoarding beneath those two blue panels. From that right blue panel window, Lady Jane saw with her very own eyes her young husband, the 19-year-old Lord Guildford Dudley, dragged out of the beach and tower, the state prison room, taken up to Tower Hill for public beheading. One hour later, she saw his headless corpse being brought back in the tower in a small handcart, immediately buried beneath the floor of the Chapel Royal. Now, if that wasn't anguish enough for a young 16-year-old girl, she saw the carpenters preparing the scaffold site behind me for her very own execution later that morning. It was a cold February morning, the 12th of February, 1554. Now, in my eyes and my heart, possibly the most tragic day in English history. Most people that come to the Tower of London only seem to talk about Queen Anne Boleyn. And I understand why. But literally nobody, nobody mentions this young, beautiful, well-educated 16-year-old girl. It is stated in history. She walked out of that blue door. She didn't cry. She didn't whimper. She placed her neck on a block of solid oak on one cold February morning and paid the ultimate price for her ambitious relatives. So I beseech you all, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, when you leave the Tower of London today, read up about Lady Jane Grey, because in my eyes and my heart, possibly the most innocent and bravest of the lot. Right now, cheer you all up, you all look really happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna leave you with a smile on your face, because I'm near the end of my tour, and I've saved the best to last. In fact, it's not just going to put a smile on your face today, you'll have the smile on your face for the rest of your life. I'm going to tell you about somebody who's very infamous in the Tower of London. I'm going to tell you all about me. <laughs> <laughs> now, when most of you arrived today, some of you have no idea who we are. As I was walking up those stairs a minute ago, a beautiful American lady at the top of the stairs just said to me, Oh my God, what a nice outfit. <laughs> I will find that young lady and torture her to an inch of her life. <laughs> now, to become a yeoman warder or a beef eater, you have to serve a minimum of 22 years in Her Majesty's Armed Forces. You must obtain the rank of Sergeant Major and hold the Long Service and Good Conduct Medal. I didn't get caught. <laughs> now, if you have those three prerequisites, that's just the requirements to apply to join. Jobs are very rare, in fact, the most sought after job in the whole of the British Armed Forces. There have only been 413 Yeoman Warders since records began. I know there are only 413 because I'm number 409. Or on Facebook, hashtag Beefy409. <laughs> Feel free to follow me, 108,000 already do. Even the Queen, God bless her. Now I'm wearing blue Tudor undress that was given to us by King Henry VIII. Chainmail and body armour would have been worn over the top. Now this is not a skirt, and unfortunately for me it's not a kilt. Leg plates would have been inserted inside to protect your lower half, especially on horseback. If you want that kind of action, Soho. <laughs> Some of you may have been. Now emblazoned on my chest is E2R. Some ladies have said, extremely romantic. But what it actually means is Elizabeth Secunda Regina, in Latin, Queen Elizabeth II, the Queen of this country, and my boss, God bless her. But in the presence of Her Majesty the Queen, we wear a totally different uniform, a red ceremonial state tunic, trimmed in lots of gold. Each tunic costs in excess of 10,000 pounds, so they only give us one of them. Around our neck, we wear a white Tudor ruff, which is like a dog going to the vet. On our head, we wear a velvet Tudor bonnet, trimmed in red, white, and blue lace. 
In our right hand, we carry an eight-foot spear called a partisan. On our left hip, we have a double-edged Wilkinson sword. Now, we are the inner cordon of Her Majesty's Royal Bodyguard, but we only protect the King or Queen on those very rare occasions. For example, a King or Queen's coronation, wedding, funeral, or opening a state parliament. So we use very rarely, and because we use very rarely, Queen Elizabeth II has now decided we can do guided tours as well. <laughs> oh well. Now on our legs in the presence of the Queen, we don't wear trousers, we wear pantaloons and tights. Because <laughs> the Queen likes it. Now there are 33 yeoman warders currently serving. Predominantly, we're made up of the British Army. Huzzah! Huzzah! However, we have five from the Royal Navy. Whee! They quite like wearing tights. <laughs> We also have five from the Royal Air Force, but nobody really speaks to them. <laughs> we have two Royal Marines, they're instantly identifiable. They're normally holding hands, skipping down water there. <laughs> now, when you become a young water, your name gets engraved in the Byward Tower. When we die, our name gets engraved in the Chapel Royal next to the Kings and Queens. There is no bigger honour that can be bestowed on any service personnel. I was sworn in on Tower Green just over three years ago. The Yeoman Warders form square around you, the constable comes out of the Queen's House where you swear an oath of allegiance to the Majesty of the Queen. If you pass your six months probation, which obviously I did, I was then taken to St. James's Palace, to the Royal Chapel, in front of the Royal Clergy, where a member of the Royal Family sits in attendance, where you're ordained by God as a bodyguard to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. It is the biggest honour that cannot just be bestowed on us, but also our family. And for the rest of our working life, we get to live in this beautiful Royal Palace and Fortress. You know you made it in life when you're riding your Harley Davidson over your own drawbridge. <laughs> we've got our own doctor, our own chaplain, but most important of all, in the bottom left-hand corner, we've got the oldest pub in the world, the Keys. No, you're not invited. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you've enjoyed my tour, there's such a thing as Tower London TripAdvisor. Now my boss reads it, and the Queen has started following. If you've enjoyed my tour, it's Young and Water Scott Kelly. Or hashtag BP409. <laughs> if you found anything I said offensive or scary, it's Yeoman Water Smith. <laughs> <laughs> now, before you all go, I live in the hospital block, which is just around the corner. I live in the penthouse, the top flat, because none of the old boys wanted to go up the stairs. I'm happy days. Now, my two daughters are visiting me. They're very young. They know how well their father will do today by the rupturous amount of cheering and applause I get. Notice, if you don't cheer really loudly, as you walk around that corner, look at that top window, and you'll see two young girls with tears rolling down their cheeks. <laughs> and you will all be to blame. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an honor and a privilege. Before I let you all go, I'm gonna make my way over there to that lamppost. If any want a picture with the best looking young water, ladies, make an orderly cue, do not rush me. <laughs> gentlemen, get to the back and be gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you very much.